the satisfaction of ripping the calendar for the next day. The thin, translucent sheet I've torn off is printed in green ink. It's Friday, but tomorrow will be the beginning of the weekend and is now printed in red to help differentiate the days. At the top half of the sheet of this tearaway lunisolar calendar is the year and month. Below has the day of the week, showcased as a large number and can be seen at a distance. Simple and straightforward enough. The bottom half of the page, however, Chinese characters varying in size from reasonable legibility to very tiny cover it. The Chinese characters separated into groups in a grid. Two animals from the Chinese zodiac could be found, each day showcasing a different set. On holidays throughout the year, there would be a mix of red and green ink with a special design different from the usual numbers. This was the Nyut Lake, the monthly calendar I grew up with. The width and the height of it is smaller than the standard 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. The curious part is how the thin sheets, one for each day of the year, all 365 managed to be bound into a booklet to be about an inch in thickness. The entire thing would be hung up. When nearing the end of the day, the sheet for that day would be torn to be used at dinner time, as a table covering for scraps and bones from the meal, and a new sheet would be seen hanging on the wall in anticipation for the following day. Now that I no longer live at home, this nostalgic item has found its way to me in the form of an Instagram account. As someone who can read only a handful of Chinese characters, I was excited to see that this version was in English. This project has allowed us to kind of feel more seen as people who can't read Chinese necessarily, but are very much Chinese and want to engage with our heritage, reconnect with our heritage, and learn more about our heritage. The stories that people share back has been so heartwarming, and then it, it makes me feel yeah, very not, not alone and, and much more connected to people, even though I don't really know them in real life, but that has been really nice. Art director and designer Sally Fung and associate creative director Jason Soy, based in Toronto, Canada, have recreated this classic Chinese household product, which became a way to connect with their heritage and others with Yutlet Club. Welcome Sally and Jason. You both started a project, and it's called Yetlik Club. Um, how'd you get into that and kind of explain what Yetlik is? Yeah, so uh, funny enough, I think we've been sitting on this idea for quite some time. So Sally and I work in advertising. We used to be a uh, art director copywriter team. And then we were kind of, we had this idea. Um, both of us are of uh, Chinese heritage and me being born in Canada, I actually can't read Chinese very well. So I, I think at one point we were just discussing um, projects and uh, it had come up that, hey, maybe it's actually worthwhile to translate the Chinese calendar for people who can't read uh, Chinese. And then we kind of sat on that idea for quite some time. And then I, I think, you know, around 2021, that's when a lot of media was focused on uh, you know, stop Asian, Asian hate. And uh, there was just a lot of um, discussion about Asian identity in North America. So seeing all that, you know, we, we really wanted to have a way to reconnect with our heritage and just kind of celebrate our heritage versus what was kind of being broadcasted in the news. Um, and then we realized, hey, we, we always had this project sitting on the back burner. Maybe we should actually do it this time. It started out as an Instagram account. Um, we started posting um, daily posts. So literally 365 days of the year. And as, as it kind of picked up more momentum, people were asking us, Hey, are you guys going to release a physical copy of the Yutlik? This is pretty cool. And then we we're like, yeah, uh, let's, let's figure out how to do that. So Yutlik for people who don't know what it is, it's, it's the traditional Chinese lunar solar calendar. Um, but we've translated it into English for people who, uh, who know of that tradition, but, uh, aren't able to read Chinese. So we like to call, say, like, it's your, it's your grandparents' calendar, but now in English. For me, growing up, I had the calendar, or at least my parents and my grandparents did. It's that class, um, it's, how do I describe it? It's each sheet of the calendar is a day 
of the week. Um, yeah. yeah. If I'm describing it correctly. And it's like made out of, I think it's like rice paper or bamboo, something really sheer. It's very, that like yeah, really, it's very thin. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny yeah. enough. Like it's like, I think a lot of people have seen it in the background of either, you know, um, Chinese restaurants or they've seen it at their grandparents' place. It's like this very colorful, like red or green tearaway calendar. So each day of the week, it's a tearaway page. Like it's very much like a, a daily calendar that um, a lot of our grandparents use, our parents use it. Um, and within the calendar, there's just so much kind of traditions and like so much part of kind of our identity and our culture it gets embedded in the calendar. Like I'm sure a lot of kind of immigrants have heard like when our family goes like, oh yeah, you know, someone's getting married. They got to check this like Chinese almanac or this like calendar to see when's a good date. And that's actually all within this calendar. But as Jason and I were kind of talking about it when we were uh, working as, as partners at work, we're just like so much of those traditions have been getting lost just because some of us don't aren't able to read the calendar anymore. Or we don't know how to read the calendar anymore. Um, so we thought this was just a nice, uh, nice way to kind of, I guess, bring it to other people and share it with other people and just to for even for ourselves to understand it a little bit more, because I don't know why there's a better day to, I guess, like cut my hair or like to move into a new house. Like um, whether you follow it or not, I think that's a, a different story, but we just think it's like a nice little tradition to, to carry on. I'm in that faction where I can't read Chinese. And so even growing up, I would look at this calendar. I'm like, there's so many, like, you know, each character is a word, but I'm like, there's so many things on here. I have no idea what it is other than the big old number. That's just like the day, which I understood, but everything else I'm like, uh, is this like, what could possibly be on here? And then finding Yet Lit Club and the translation for it, I was like, oh, this is, this makes so much more sense. Um, I'm able to interpret or like kind of see how that translated and worked out because um how was trying to figure out did you also have an almanac or did you find someone that could read it like how was figuring that out yeah i mean yeah there was a lot of homework to be done for sure uh i think like for us we actually source a lot of information online as well as um you know we have we have um obviously our aunties and uncles and parents to lean on when it comes to translations and stuff like that you know, we, we do try to like um, essentially look at a bunch of different sources for all the different types of information because a lot of it is scattered across the internet. And then we compile it all together, interpret it as best as we can. And then, uh, yeah, we share it. It's a lot of definitely working with like our kind of our elders and yeah. our aunties and uncles who have a lot more knowledge than we do. Um, and then we just, yeah, do a lot of research and ask them to be like, help us. Like, what is how do you read this? Like, I think there's still so many different interpretations. Like, I think the gods is one that I don't know if we exactly gotten like a, a clear answer of like how people read the gods and how, like what the different directions mean. Uh, everyone we ask kind of have a slightly different tradition and a slightly different rule. Like some people are like, oh, it's a god of prosperity and it's like south and therefore you got to wake up and you, when you exit your door, like when you leave your house, you got to walk south. And then other people are like, no, 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 that's where you're supposed to like be praying every morning. And so there's like all these different interpretations, but that's also been really part of the fun in the learning too. I mean, one of the, the most popular parts I would say in the calendar is really the auspicious things to do and not do. It has all the ones of like, if you are getting married, like which is a good day. And to be honest, I don't know if we fully know how all of that is calculated. There is the kind of the Chinese almanac, and I think there's always the feng shui masters who are able to read it, and that's where we really rely on our elders to help us. But the the do's and do nots are always very interesting for us, and they're translating it has been really fun because there's just almost all these additional traditions that I didn't know. So like, I didn't know, like there was just some Chinese characters as I was going through it and talking to my mom about it, like there were certain days where if someone passed away, like you were supposed to actually dress them a certain day on a certain day, but then you would also, sorry, this is a little dark, but you would leave the body in the house for a certain day, like a certain period of time. And then there's actually a day that you're supposed to take the body out and then have your actual funeral and whatnot. But like they were actually separated into like six different parts and there are six different good days, quote unquote, to do it. But there were all these little 
well, bits and pieces too. Construction or reconstruction of your home or renovations of your home also had good days and bad days. But a lot of it also came from more like communal living is what it, it really seemed like. It was just more like like having kind of set rules of like when's a good time for everyone to do this. So let's start with Jason, but how has this project helped you connect with your heritage and in what ways? And then we'll go to Sally. I, I think I alluded to it earlier, but uh, I was born in Canada. So um, growing up, I feel like I was already more, I guess, influenced with Western culture or even pop culture. And uh, I think it wasn't really until like later on in my life where I discovered this like growing want to reconnect with my Asian heritage, just because it, it's when you're, you're kind of like learning more about yourself, it's almost like a, a part of you that I guess was like less explored, at least in my case, I, I didn't really explore my Asian heritage as much as I, I would have liked to. So um, at, with this project, it was just a great opportunity to, you know, sit down with my parents and just talk about certain traditional things, like obviously, you know, they, they're, my parents are very big on consulting the Chinese almanac for all the special dates. So even just like being able to hear from them firsthand, like what they're actually doing and why they're doing it and like what it means to them and why these auspicious readings are so important to them uh, was really great. And then, uh, yeah, being able to kind of take part in that tradition too is is awesome. And, and funny enough, like I, I think when I was a kid, I did a lot of translations for my parents because like they're, they're immigrant parents. So they had to like, you know, rely on me to um, translate a lot of English things. But now, but I, I, I do feel like both of us are translating information still for like more than just our parents now. It's like kind of like for a community, which is really awesome. And another great part of it is just like um, hearing what this means to the community because it it's you realize you're, you're part of a greater whole, even though this is this kind of like a thing that's just kind of sitting in the background. You know, a lot of people aren't necessarily, you know, looking at the calendar as a as a centerpiece in their home. But like now that we're shining a spotlight on it, a lot of people have actually come forward and, and said like, oh, my God, like I had that as a kid. This is so nostalgic. It's so great to be able to like learn about all these different things that are actually on the calendar that they might have just not known about before like like Sally mentioned the auspicious readings or like the dream analyses and so on. I think this project for me actually brought me a lot closer to my parents in in a way. I was I was born in Hong Kong and then I immigrated um, to actually to Vancouver and then moved over to Toronto after Um, but having been in Toronto and actually lived away from my parents for a good portion of my I guess like since university and then now now working um there's definitely like once I've moved away from home, I've been feeling more disconnected from kind of the Asian culture. Um, like I don't speak Chinese on a day to day basis anymore. Whereas if I lived at home, I would talk to my parents in Cantonese all the time. So actually creating this project actually kind of brought me back to kind of reconnecting with my culture a lot more, um, learning a lot more of the traditions like and now I actually try to follow them a little bit more like I used to when I was growing up and living with my parents. But when I'm on my own, like, I don't know, most of my my friends don't follow the same traditions as I do. So started to lose that. So I think this project has been really nice. And and then I get to have more of a topic to talk to my parents about as opposed to just like, I don't know, what's going on with work or how's it going with your boyfriend or whatever. So this is like a nice kind of third topic that I am very happy to talk to them about and then just learn a lot more from them. Actually, just building on what Sally was saying, it's, it's a very nice excuse to message your parents and like kind of get the conversation rolling too, because there could be a specific set festival and you're like, you know, Hey, happy, you know, mid autumn festival. And then all of a sudden you're talking about different things again. It's just like a nice way to kind of break the ice. I think with a lot of traditional immigrant parents, it, it's sometimes hard to like just find a easy topic to talk about without it feeling awkward. And, you know, with this, it's just like, oh, hey, remember you can't cut your hair today or, you know, hey, <laughs> remember it's a good day to go fishing. So, you know, better check it out. It's a good segue to, I find, into kind of learning about their stories. Because mm-hmm. um, sometimes I find like they don't, I don't know, share their stories as openly. Being more Asian parents sometimes are a little bit more, I guess, introverted in a way. So this has been a nice way to, yeah, kind of to segue into that. Be like, okay, yeah, you can't cut your hair. And then somehow they'll have this like three hour long story that they'll start telling. 
what have you both uh, learned from this experience? And then we'll, we'll jump to Jason first. <laughs> I mean, like a lot of traditional things for sure. I, I've learned like even just um, like funny enough, one of my favorite parts about the project is the, the Chinese proverbs, just because there's this like wealth of knowledge or just like a wealth of wisdom. You know, you kind of hear those like Confucius sayings before and you're kind of like, oh, okay, they are what they are. But then there's just like so many of them, especially when you, you kind of dive into them. So on a literal level, like of learning, I'm, I'm learning all these traditions there. But in terms of a deeper level, I think things that you think are small actually resonate with people a lot more than you think. Because again, a, a wall calendar, you think that's just something that, you know, is part of everybody's everyday lives. People usually take it for granted, but somehow it's managed to connect with so many of our followers. And then they'll, they'll come back to us with stories saying like, oh, hey, like uh, this, this reminds me of, you know, such and such who may have passed away, for example. And uh, thank you for like uh, having this project because it, because it kind of reminds me of them or brings me closer to them. Basically, this project taught me that like we're more connected than we think, I guess. I, I think so for me too. Like I, I think like Jason was saying, like we started this project um, kind of during the COVID when there was a lot of kind of chatter about kind of our, everyone's kind of identity and like our learning more about reconnecting with kind of our cultures and whatnot. And I think for me too, that this project made me feel a lot less alone in the sets. Like, I think that was one thing I really learned was like, there are so many people like us uh, that have immigrated that are, are here that have a very similar upbringing. And I think through this project, that's what we've learned, like with the online community, which has been so crazy. It is just this one random calendar that we thought was like a fun side project for a while. Um, but the stories that people share back has been so heartwarming. And then it, it makes me feel, yeah, very not not alone and, and much more connected to people, even though I don't really know them in real life. But that has been really nice. So how has this project uh, affected your relationship with each other and like from coworkers and maybe business partners? I don't know. Jason and I have worked together for four years, I guess, professionally in our professional life. Uh, I think this project has been nice. Like working in advertising, like a lot of times the projects are kind of geared towards the mass, kind of the mass audience. Um, so to, for us to do something that's very, that expresses our cultural identity has been really nice. And I think it, it brought us closer together in that sense. Like there's so many times when we're brainstorming and we have this kind of more insightful things, but it's maybe not crazy relevant to everyone. And that's always hard to bring out in our kind of professional careers. I don't know. I think we're pretty proud to see it actually works and still is relevant and there is still a big market for it and all that. I think we've gotten closer through this. Yeah, for sure. I, I think you know, Sally was always great to work with before. Uh, I think like I've actually seen a lot of growth in her in this project. Like she's actually taken a lot, a lot of the the hard parts of the project on, you know, like Sally takes on the majority of it and then learning about the production and trying to keep the production of the calendar as authentic to the the daily calendar as possible. For example, trying to get the paper to feel like that kind of like very thin rice paper feeling like Sally's all over that in terms of like trying to get that experience to really match what we have in that like nostalgic memory I should say of the calendar um so I, I'm like super proud of her for this one and I think like what's cool about this project too is like it really is a blend of our identities because again I, I speak primarily English this project's also English but I think the more you put your personality into it, I think the fact that this actually resonates with so many Canadians and Americans and, you know, people in Australian stuff just goes to show that even though you're putting a lot of yourself into the project, it, it could still actually um, be relatable to so many different people. Different. Even even like seeing uh, parents who primarily only speak Chinese pick up a yutlik for their kid. I'm like, oh, wow, this is like pretty cool that you realize like your kids grew up in a certain way, like maybe like a more Canadian, a Chinese Canadian sort of way. And then this product is like perfect for them. So question for both of you. So what does it mean to be someone of, you know, Asian uh, heritage and then living in the West, in the Western society? And how have you navigated that? I think growing up in Canada and being Chinese, I, I, the, the funny thing is, 
um, I wasn't, I guess, Western enough for um, Canadians and I wasn't Chinese enough for Chinese people. And I, I think that naturally led me to focus more on, I guess, shared experiences. And that mainly was pop culture growing up. And that kind of led me into the career I currently have, which is in advertising. But as I got older, I started craving just connections to who I who I am and like different facets of myself. And I think that's kind of almost like unlocking a new side of myself when I dove into my Asian heritage and learned more about Chinese traditions. And I figured if I was having that feeling, I'm sure a lot of Canadians have that feeling as well, just because they, so many Canadians, so many Chinese Canadians don't have the ability to read Chinese, for example. I, I figured that, hey, there's there's more of us out there. And this is this project has allowed us to kind of feel more seen as people who can't read Chinese necessarily, but are very much Chinese and want to engage with our heritage, reconnect with our heritage and learn more about our heritage. Yeah. I, I think the uh, the point you said about always feel like I never Western enough for kind of my Western friends or like, and then not being Chinese enough for my Chinese friends. I always felt like you're, you're in this in between um, and you're always trying to figure out, you're like, where do I sit and where do I stand? And it's, it's not easy, I will say. I, like, it's actually, it's it was difficult. Because, um, like, even now, my my friends back in Vancouver, a lot of them actually read Chinese. So even though with, say, like, with this calendar, they don't actually need it because they are very fluent in it. They know it. They have continued to watch TVB dramas. Um, whereas my friends in, in Toronto, I do find their, um, I think it's just the, the group that I surround myself with is slightly different where we are in the bit more of the in-between but I do think it's it's tough because I think it, it is that kind of Asian Canadian, uh, I guess Asian Americans as well. Like it's that as much as I think a lot of times people talk about it as like it's like one experience, but it's actually so many experiences. The first generation versus like an immigrant, like you have shared experiences, but the nuances is actually there's quite a bit of it, too. So trying to find that has been difficult, but. But I think this project in particular has just made me feel a lot less alone and a lot more seen and to know that there's so many other people that are, I don't want to say we're struggling, but yeah, so many people are kind of craving that connection has been really nice. And It's, it's interesting because this this notion of the in-betweener, um, I feel that word is such a great way to describe the experience, just like almost the confusion of like, what am I supposed to be like, should I actually like be more Chinese or more Western. And this product is kind of like the nice bridge in between the where you don't have to choose. You could actually, you know, learn about your your heritage while also engaging with it in a way that feels maybe more natural to you because you were raised in the West. That was my conversation with Yetlet Club creators Sally Fung and Jason Soy. You can find out more about Yetlet Club at yetlet.club. That's Y-U-T-L-I-K dot C-L-U-B. For more information on this episode and the series, head to pbsreno.org slash Refugee's Daughter. And a special thank you to Sally and Jason for joining the show. Subscribe to Refugee's Daughter wherever you listen to podcasts and give the show a rating and review. I'm Christina Lee, and thanks for listening. This episode was written by Christina Lee with production help from Divergent Point Media, Refugee's Daughter is a presentation of PBS Reno.